Does your uh, husband stop and ask for directions when he's lost? It was a classic vacation moment for me. We were uh, looking for our hotel. It was one of those easy off the interstate, you know, easy to find, right in the heart of downtown St. Louis. And we were driving through, and uh, boy, we looked for that thing for I don't know how long. And, and Carlin had the, uh, the map all opened and spread out on her side of the car. And I started circling these neighborhoods over and over. And I passed this gas station. Uh, this all-night gas station about 13 times. The guy thought I was casing the joint, you know, I was gonna, <laughs> gonna knock it off. And, and, uh, and, and Carlin kept, you know, very gently and nicely insisting that I pull over and ask for directions. And uh, boy, I just had a hard time doing that for some reason. But finally, with my, uh, my masculinity uh, completely uh, uh, disheveled and dragging behind me, I pulled into the, uh, the gas station and said, hey, I'm looking for this hotel. And sure enough, directions, go here, go there, found our way there. By that time, it was about 1.30 in the morning, I think, and uh, we pulled into the, uh, the hotel. But I realized that by not asking directions, I had wasted a lot of time. And uh, that didn't go over real well with my family that day. And you know, it's, it's one thing when you're uh, looking for a hotel. Uh, it's another thing when you're dealing with something as critical and as time sensitive a as parenting. I say that because most people, uh, though they're in, in the middle of, of raising children, most people don't uh, stop and ask for directions. It's hard. It's challenging. They realize that. They, they, they try to do better. They try to raise better kids. They try to be better moms and dads. But very few people really stop and say, we need to, to look at the map or we need to better yet consult the author of this thing and, and find out how to do it better. I say that not because it's just an overgeneralization, but because in a survey that the Barna Research Group did, they found that professing Christian parents, professing Christian parents, only one-third of them said, yeah, we use biblical principles to raise our children. The vast majority said, here's what they said, the church nor the Bible play any role in how we parent our kids. And I thought, what a tragedy. What a tragedy when we say we are Christians, we want to do things God's way, but when it comes to parenting, we, we just haven't taken the time to figure this all out. And I think some of us are afraid to go to the Bible to find direction for parenting because we're afraid what we might find. We might see that it doesn't jive with the latest uh, PhD uh, you know, book on uh, how to raise your tot, and um, we struggle with whether or not we're going to abandon the, uh, the latest and greatest uh, child-rearing information for the... Uh, information transmitted through some camel-riding, sandal-clad, bearded prophet, you know, of the Old Testament. Well, if that's your fear, let me just uh, confirm it, because, uh, um, because the, the great thing is that when we look at, at Scripture, the Bible has given us principles that are enduring, not only from the time they were written, but the Scripture uh, was written over a 1,400-year period, and uh, the principles of child-rearing laid out for us are, are perfectly consistent. And yet the uh, latest uh, parenting gurus, their information, it comes and it goes. I mean, the, the PhDs write their latest book on how to raise kids. Everybody buys into it. This is the way to do it. This is how we approach it. And then tomorrow, it, it's gone. One day it's hailed as the greatest news and the greatest advice, and the next day it's derided as old stuff. If you don't believe that, let me read for you a very popular and very uh, uh, um, uh, well-received book from the 1920s on how you ought to raise your kids. A book entitled The Psychological Care of Infants and Children, written in 1928. And here's the advice to parents. Believe it or not, this was a well-selling, highly respected leader in the child-rearing uh, community. He said, parents should never hug or kiss their children. Never let them sit on your lap. I love this. If you must uh, kiss them, then kiss them once on the forehead and then say good night. In the morning, shake their hands. I mean, people were paying money to, to read this stuff and say, well, oh, this is, if we're going to, you know, not damage our kids, this is how we, we're supposed to do it, because, you know, that we've got to be real careful. I didn't even read it all. He goes on to say that if you love them too much, then there's going to be this uh, never healing wound inflicted upon them, which make, make their infancy unhappy, their adolescence a nightmare, and, and uh, you will ultimately, it says, destroy your son or daughter's future vocation and chances at marital happiness. So think of that next time you give them a hug and a kiss goodnight, you know. Now, that's funny. It's easy to laugh at that. But, I mean, this was the best-selling stuff. This was the cutting-edge parenting. If you really want to raise your kid right, I mean, this is how you do it. And, uh, 
Yeah, now we look at it and say it's no big deal. But I can say a lot of things about parenting right now from this stage that a lot of you would nod your head and go, hmm, yeah, that's, hmm, I've heard that. That sounds good. That's important. And, you know, it's junk. It's just junk. And Scripture says here is the never-changing, enduring principles of parenting. Go here. You want information? Go here. This is where we go. And yet today, people have uh, at sometimes embraced parts of it, and then, ah, we don't like that in this generation, and the next generation, well, this is good, we'll take that from the Bible, but you can't take it all, and you know, it's dated, and it's cultural, and it's different times then. Just don't believe it. Don't believe it. You want to raise uh, kids by the latest parenting techniques, no telling what you'll end up with. You want to raise godly kids God's way, then we, we need to look to Scripture to find out how to do that. So this morning, what I want to do for just a few minutes, and I know I'll only scratch the surface, I want to see some of God's wisdom and how moms and dads ought to be raising juniors. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3, and let us look at what God has to say about the matter as we continue our series through these four verses that help us understand how God would like the family to operate. Verse 21. It addresses parents, the context you might remember, verse 20, that the children are to obey their parents. Do it in everything, for that paradigm it pleases God. When the children obey the authority of parents, that's good, God likes that. And then we turn to the parents. The context is obedience. We're going to talk about raising our kids to be obedient kids. And he addresses parents with an interesting word. What's the first word in verse 21? Let me hear it. What is it? Fathers. Wow. That's interesting. Their day was no different than our day. Moms had the primary caregiving responsibility for children. No different then than it is now. And yet Scripture chooses to bring the male name, the the nomenclature for for dads, to the forefront and say, hey, dads, I got some information for you. Now, you need to know that in Scripture, the word dads or fathers is not consistently translated fathers. Fathers. There are times in Scripture, inside and outside of Scripture, where that word clearly represents both parents. So it's not like he's just being exclusive and saying, let me just talk to dads about parenting. Although use of the word dads to represent both parents clearly makes the man sit up straight and say, oh, this must include me. Yeah, it includes you, and it includes you in a very critical and important way. Did you know that uh, almost 36% of all kids born in America today will not grow up with their dads? They just won't grow up with their dad. Their dad won't be there. That's right, almost a third of all kids born today are born to uh, unwed moms. That's the trend today. Of those that don't grow up with their dad, only 24% of the kids uh, will see their dad in a given year. This is just unhealthy statistics for what's happening in our culture, and that is that more and more people in our day see dad as an expendable part of the equation. Oh, it would be good if he were here, but we can do without it. And some people in the, uh, you know, in the media, the entertainment industry, like to uh, hail the fact that it's really not important at all. Well, it's very important. In, in Scripture, it is super important. As a matter of fact, dads, it's time for us, number one on your outline, to recognize just how important we are in this whole thing. Number one, realize or recognize the importance of dad. Dad being a part of the parenting equation in the biblical paradigm is essential. It is important, and it cannot be something that we see as expendable. It's critical. Dad, are you doing your job? Are you part of this mix? Have you delegated and relegated all the responsibility for raising Junior to your wife? If you have, you're missing out on what God says it's going to take to raise godly, well-rounded kids. We've got to have dad to be a part of this. I could read you all the other side of the statistics that relate to what happens when dad isn't there, but that would depress us too much. We won't go there. You just need to know that without your input, we're in trouble. Without your input, your kids lose. Without your input, it's very difficult for us to raise the kind of kids that God wants us to raise. So your role is important. Let me turn you to Deuteronomy 6 to illustrate it for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God had summed up through uh, Moses the prophet all these wonderful statements of life, rules of life, the, the commands of God, the standards of God, how to live a holy life. And coming to the end of this in the uh, Pentateuch, starting the book of Deuteronomy, the restatement of the law, after some very important summaries of the law in Deuteronomy 4 and 5, he gets to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and he says, Some important things for dads. And remember the primary audience here is the heads of Jewish homes. Doesn't exclude the moms, but certainly dads are in view when this statement is made. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, begin in verse number 6. 
as Moses says, these commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. This is something, all that's been summarized here in the giving of the law, it is to saturate your being, it is to be a part of your life. And then he says in verse number seven, impress them on your children. Impress them on your children. What's most interesting about that is the Hebrew word we translate impress there is translated in every other occurrence in the Hebrew Old Testament. All throughout all the Old Testament books, it is translated to describe how a knife or a sword or a dagger is sharpened. It is a word that talks about taking some material and getting it useful for some kind of task or job. It is usually translated to sharpen or to wet, to be able to take something like a, like a dagger and make it sharp. Now, when I was a kid, my dad gave me a pocket knife. I know that's illegal and unthinkable now. But, uh, you know, he taught me to carry around a pocket knife because you might need a pocket knife. And dad was pretty insistent that it ought to be sharp. And so when I was really young, he gave me a sharpening stone, and I, I was taught how to sharpen my pocket knife. Now, uh, as I got older, of course, these things stuck with me. If uh, you catch me during the week and you have a package to open, hey, you're in luck because if I'm standing nearby, I'll probably have a pocket knife to hand you. The problem is I wouldn't want you to show my pocket knife to my dad because my pocket knife is generally dull. Now, it's not that I don't have a sharpening stone. You go upstairs and, and look into my briefcase right now, you're going to find a little pocket sharpening stone. I carry one with me. My knife and my sharpening stone are in general proximity uh, with each other on a regular basis. The problem is the sharpening stone and the knife rarely get together. Uh, so what happens is I carry around a dull knife most of the time. It's not for the lack of equipment that my knife is dull. It's just the lack of effort to put the two together. And some of you may be saying, you know what, you've taught on marriage. We're really committed to that. Our marriage hasn't fallen apart. We're going to stay in this thing. And, and you've got the tools to, to raise some godly kids. The problem is dads need to be a part of the process of sharpening those kids. And, and so often we're passing in the hallways, we're driving off to work before they wake up, we're coming home late, uh, you know, we're so tied up with, with housework on the weekend or whatever we're doing, our hobbies, our trips, we're not spending much time sharpening our kids. I mean, the, the sharpening stone and, and the young knives in our house, if you will, are rarely getting together. And there's not that impressing of what God has taught you, the impressing of your life experience on the character of your children, and it needs to happen. What context? Keep going in verse 7. Well, you're to take the things that God has taught you and all you've learned, and you're to talk about them with your kids. When? When we were sitting around at home. I understand that was easier before the, the advent of television, but, I mean, the idea here was there's a lot of interaction going on between dad and the kids uh, around the house. When they walked along the road, that assumed dad took the kids with him from time to time when he walked along the road. When he laid down with the kids and when he got the kids up in the morning, there was this activity and this constant interaction between parent and child that gave the opportunity for parents to impress upon their kids these things. But much more active than that, to sharpen these kids with their experience in life and character. And so let's just get practical, dads. I mean, how, how are you doing? I mean, you're doing a good job at this? You don't, and here's the problem with parenting. You only have a short amount of time to do this. You realize that your influence and, and your, your involvement in, in sharpening these kids gets less and less every year that goes by. And eventually they leave the home, as we, we talked about last week, and then we're wondering when they're going to call us, and they're gone. So right now you've just got a few years left. You want to climb the corporate ladder. You want to knock yourself out at work. Can you wait a few years? You, you understand what I'm saying? You won't have long if, you're, if your kids are in the house. The, the time is slipping away. Is it worth maybe ratcheting back at the office a little bit so that you can spend more days walking along the road with your kid? Is it worth it for you maybe to think about uh, uh, passing on the promotion so that you can be putting your kids to bed at night? Do you understand what I'm saying? It is time for us to reprioritize our life. It is not about what people in Orange County think it's about. It, it is about us recognizing that if I'm going to raise godly kids, what God has taught me and instilled in my life, I need to make the effort. Why don't you leave the office early a little bit this week? Why don't you go in late? Why don't you get your kids up? Why don't you take them to breakfast? Why don't you do a couple McDonald's trips? Just you and the kids this week. Do you understand? It's time for us to redouble our efforts in spending time communicating, walking along the road, talking with them in our homes. Dads, your role is important. Don't underestimate it. And when Paul says in Colossians 3.21, fathers, I know he's thinking of both parents, but when that word is used, it sure gets the attention of dads. And we realize we're part of this thing, and it's a critical and important part 
in the biblical model. Fathers, and then here comes the command. Are you ready? Verse 21. It's a prohibition. It's a negative command. Remember the context. The context is obedient children. Obedient children assumes that they need some direction. They may have a bent to being self-centered and selfish and doing whatever they want whenever they want, but parents need to get their kids to obey. Well, here he gives a negative prohibition. When you're in the process of doing that, he says, don't embitter your children. Don't embitter your children. Tough word to translate. It's only used once in the New Testament, but it's been translated in a variety of ways. Don't uh, irritate them. Don't uh, exasperate them. Don't, uh, don't do your parenting in such a way that you uh, really grate against the kid in a way that, that doesn't accomplish the kind of, of nurturing and, and the raising of the kid the way God intended it to be. Now, it's all about correction. You've got to understand that. If we just let our kids do whatever they want, that, that's, not, that's not the idea. Dads and moms have to take an active role in changing the course of this kid. But in doing so, don't do it in a way that embitters them. Look across the way, if you would, to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, the parallel passage. Whereas in Colossians 3, some things are assumed about the process of raising kids. In Ephesians, they're spelled out for us. They're clear. Some words are given in Ephesians 6 that help us understand what this looks like. Again, you can see how, how this, parallels, this parallels our passage in Colossians 3 so well. Statement to children, we've got that in verse 20. In our passage here in verses 1 through 4, 1 through 3, we see that to kids. Kids ought to, ought to do this. Verse 5, we turn the attention to parents, and again, the word fathers is used to summarize the mom and dad's role together, and the same and very similar phrase is given here in verse 4. Different word, same idea. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Okay? Now, he gives us what's being assumed in Colossians, and that is what's going on. My job is to, summed up in three words, and really translates one word in the original language, bring them up. I'm supposed to bring them up. In other contexts, that's translated to nurture. I'm, I'm helping to develop this young thing, like a gardener with a young plant. I'm helping it grow up. I, I'm, I'm cultivating it. I'm the gardener. I'm nurturing that. It's a very tender word, actually. And then, as though uh, we've kind of got this word that comes right after it that almost seems harsh in contrast, perhaps not in our English text, training doesn't seem so harsh, but if you really think about training in the biblical context, that's a pretty hard word. Matter of fact, in some contexts, this is translated chastisement. It is, it is really the rigors of getting someone to stop doing what they're doing that's not helping them for their task. We see it often in an athletic context. Nurture, develop these kids. And then the first word is this, this word for, for training, discipline. Then the next word is a little bit different, instruction. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Instruction is the word, very strong word for, for admonition, for exhorting our kids. This is the right way. It's as though these two words describe this overarching word to nurture, to bring them up. It's going to include some kind of, of, of chastisement, some kind of discipline, if you will, and then some kind of admonishment, some kind of exhortation, some kind of, of, of discipleship, if you will. And those are two good words to summarize both sides of it. When you bring up your kids, it involves two basic categories of things, discipline and discipleship. Saying, no, don't go down that road, and enforcing that in some way, and then saying, this is the road to take, go this way. Don't go that way, you're going to get hurt, that'll hurt your life. Don't develop those characters, this, these are the characters to develop, go this way. We discipline and, and we disciple. We tell them, no, don't go in the wrong way, and we tell them, yes, please, let's go in the right way. Nurture, though, is that wonderful tender word that sits over it all. If you take those three words, nurture, and the word training and instruction, and you see that, and then you look at our passage, and you think about the, the parent not embittering their kids, then, then it kind of falls into place, okay? It, it is a loving and, and a tender dispensing of discipline and discipleship. Okay? I put it this way in your outline, and then we'll try and substantiate and develop it for you. Number two, if we're going to deal with our kids in a biblical way, and again, the assumption in the context of Colossians 3 is correction. We need to correct them, right, because we love them. Correct because you love. And that's a little different than some of what we often do in our correction. Correct because you love. Let me illustrate for you. If in the lobby you caught me just before I walked up here on stage, and you noticed I had a donut crumb on my nose... A big one. Uh, or better yet, let's just assume that my zipper was fully down, all right? That's better. Picture that, but not for too long. 
There I am, totally unprepared to go up. I'm thinking I'm prepared. I don't see this. I don't know what's going on. What would you do? Okay, what would you do? Now, is it comfortable for you to tell your pastor that his zipper is down? Is that going to be a fun conversation for you? Probably not. Embarrassing. And if at the same time you're having to say, hey, uh, you know, you're having to point out something on my nose. I mean, this is, this is tough, man. But if you, if you cared, I think you'd say something. Because marching down the aisle and coming up here and having me realize that my zipper down is a whole nother ball game, right? To deal with it in the lobby seems to be a safer environment than to deal with it on the stage. And I would hope that if you saw my zipper down, you would definitely tell me in the lobby and not let me know on the stage, <laughs> right? Now, keep your finger in, in, in Ephesians, because we're going to come back to that. But turn over to Proverbs with me. And let me show you what the whole principle of parenting is about. Proverbs 27. Now, this is not a parenting passage, but this is really what it comes down to. All right? Some people have a hard time seeing that their role is to correct their kids. Some really don't even buy into that. If you were raised on the pop psychology of the 70s, we were told, let your kids, you know, draw on the walls and, you know, express themselves and don't give them boundaries. Let them explore and be, let Johnny just fully develop into whatever he'll develop into. Well, that's stupid. But, uh, but, you know, some people really believed that. But according to the Bible, we have children that are depraved. They have a sin problem. Their natural bent is not to develop into something beautiful. Their, their natural bent is to develop into something sinful. And parents' perspective from Scripture is to take those kids and redirect their life, to, to discipline them when they're going down wrong paths and to disciple them so that they will go down right paths. See, that is the goal of Christian parenting. Now, some people, in looking at discipline and discipleship, think, well, if I love them, then there won't be any real tough stuff that happens. There will never be real serious discipline, and, and discipleship will be more suggestions and not really imperatives. Well, that's not what Scripture says. Look at, look at Proverbs 27, verse number 5. Very clear principle applies to friendships. It applies to parenting. The text says, better is open rebuke. Better is open rebuke than, than hidden love. See? See? Now, let's take that a step further. Verse 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Why? Because my friend loves me. I know that if he hurts me, it's because it's for my own good. If you embarrass me in the lobby by saying, hey, pal, your zipper's down, uh, I would rather have that open rebuke than for you to say and pretend that you love me but not point out my, my wrong because I'm going to walk up on the stage and it'll be far worse there than it would be in the lobby. And therefore, the text says an enemy is going to multiply kisses. I mean, the enemy can sit there and, and, and say they love you, but if they don't love you enough to correct, then they really don't love you. And that's why Scripture, when it takes this principle and applies it to parenting, says the one who spares the rod hits his son. The rod was the shepherd's rod, and it was used to spank, you know, uh, shepherd's kids. Not just uh, putting the sheep in line, but it was a tool of spanking. And the text says, if you're not willing to discipline your children, see, then you hate your, your children. But if you love your children, you discipline them diligently. Now, the thing is, some people think, if I love my children, I, I, won't, I won't ever really, correction won't be a, a serious matter. It won't be a big issue. You know, it should somehow just be all natural and should flow and should be peaceful. It's not always peaceful. Matter of fact, real discipline that tells kids this is the wrong way, according to Hebrews 12, verses 4 through 11, which is a good passage for all parents to study, Hebrews 12, 4 through 11, reminds us that discipline is painful. Discipline is unpleasant. And discipleship is not a process of suggestions or, 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 or nice uh, comments. It's, it's oftentimes a real strong urging. It's imperatives. It's directives. It's commands. Sometimes it's rules. Sometimes it's regulations. And parents have to realize that they are called to be disciplinarians and disciplers in their homes. And that sometimes will mean that Johnny needs a spank or the teenager needs to be grounded and that there's going to be issues that cause pain or some kind of deprivation of social activities or whatever it is in the life of your children because you love them. See, if you love them, then you say, I'd much rather you deal with the zipper being down in the privacy of our home and in the, in the youth of your childhood than to walk out on the stage of life and to have the same problem there where the consequences are so much greater. Do you understand that? When, when my six-year-old is corrected by diligent discipline from being a rebellious person against authority, he's much better off at six finding that out and curbing that problem than he is at 16, and much better at 16 than 26. 
because the consequences are increasingly greater. Here's a passage for you to jot down. It's very helpful for us. Here's what the scripture says, and here's ultimately who your kids will have to deal with. This is Galatians chapter 6, verse number 4. Your, your kids are going to ultimately have to deal with God and God's economy, God's rules, God's parenting, God's authority. And here's what scripture says. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Now, if we believe that, that's a paradigm under which your kids will have to live for the rest of their lives. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he reaps. You know what that's saying? There are consequences for wrong behavior. And there are rewards for good behavior. That is the way it works. He goes on to talk about sowing to the flesh, reaping corruption, sowing to the spirit, doing righteous things, and reaping God's blessing. But the point is, God's not mocked. That's the way the rules work. Your wonderful opportunity as a parent is to get your kids to experience consequences and rewards for behavior as children so that they develop in the midst of temptation the choice to choose right over wrong. And so that when they deal with God, they end up dealing with his blessing, not his discipline or chastisement. That's the goal. And it's so much of an opportunity. But some parents think that love in some way excludes serious discipline in the home or excludes some kind of serious discipleship or mentoring, that we just kind of let the flowers grow. It's just not that way. And it's not that way. And people that have tried it, you, you see the outcome of this, right? Correct because you love. And if you correct because you love, you will correct in love. Let me say that under number two. And one of the problems with some of you, if I talk about discipline or spanking, your head spins around because you think, you know what? I was disciplined as a kid. I was spanked as a kid. And it sure wasn't a loving experience in our house. See? Well, if, if that was your experience and you think that going into spanking as a parent now means it's just the unloading of your anger on your kids because they upset you, then you don't understand biblical New Testament or Old Testament discipline. It is not something done in anger. As a matter of fact, if you are angry when you discipline, then you're not truly disciplining because discipline does not happen because we're mad. Discipline, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, is because we love the child, and that ought to be evident in your disposition. We discipline our kids in love because we discipline our kids because we love. And so we need to be real careful about that. Before any of you start disciplining in a biblical way, you'd better be sure you understand that. We don't discipline our kids because they irritate us. It's not retribution. It is not some kind of quid pro quo. You hurt me. I'm hurting you. You, you embarrass me at the restaurant, so now you're going to get it. It's not about that. You know, It's about, listen, here, you are going to learn a pattern of life. And if you talk to your mom that way, or you, you treat authority that way, or if you can't come home on time because there are issues out there and I gave you a curfew and you're trying to stretch these rules, I'm just telling you, you need to learn that there are consequences for crossing over the lines. When you transgress the rules, certainly when you get into the real world and on the stage of life and transgress God's rules, man, there are consequences. God is not mocked. Man sows what he reaps. So because I love you, I need to teach you that lesson now. And I'd rather teach you that at 14 or at 4 or at 1 than to have you learn it at 40. Because at 40, the consequences can be devastating. One more passage, chapter 19, Proverbs 19. This is a dramatic way to say it. I understand it's a dramatic way to say it. And some of you may claim this is hyperbolous and fine, whatever. It's, I mean, it's a dramatic way to say it. But the bottom line is, this is what it comes down to. Proverbs 19, verse 18. It says, discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Right? We're trying to change the direction of this kid's life. Here's the dramatic part. Are you ready? And do not be a willing party to his death. Okay? You know what Scripture's saying there? It's much like me saying to you, if I walked up here and my zipper's fully down, and I get laughed at and ridiculed and embarrassed, and I turn red, and I realize that you saw it in the lobby, but you did not correct me. See? Then you've become an accomplice in my embarrassment. Right? When I get out on the stage of life and I rebel against authority and I get nailed for it in God's economy or the workplace, and I look back at my parents who never taught me there were consequences for rebellion, do you understand what happens? Then they become an accomplice to my failure. I know this is really hard to understand for some people, and it's very hard to assume responsibility for our, for our children's lives, but some of the broken marriages... See, of our children are based on the fact that we didn't lay down the rules in our house and we didn't discipline our children and we didn't disciple our children. And we become a, a party, we become an accomplice to the failed marriage. 
We become an accomplice to the, to the unemployment. We become an accomplice to the fact that he's busted for drugs. Or we become, see, because all of a sudden, we didn't do what God says we should do at the very early stages of life. Discipline your son. Because in that, there's hope. If we can teach him now, if my, if my three-year-old can learn it now, wow, there's hope that when he's 30, 36, he'll, he'll know it. Oh, there's hope in that. See? But if I say, nah, whatever. I, you know, I, I'm too, I, it's too hard. I don't, I don't want to crush his ego or whatever my excuse is. See, then I become an accomplice to his, to his failure. Strong way to put it. And in some cases, I suppose it can be literal. Even his death, I become a willing party in physical death. But the scripture says don't. Discipline your son, for in that there's hope. There's hope. All right, there's so much more that could be said about this, and the problem is I just cannot delve into it deeply enough, and that is my major frustration this weekend. I mean, major frustration. So all I could do is give you some, some starting points, and if you want to take this further, and if you want to learn how to discipline and disciple your kids, on the back I've given you like seven or eight book titles. And... Uh, if you are in the throes of parenting right now, your kids are in your home and you're still you know, looking, I'm just saying pull over, get some direction. And all these books can lead you to the Word of God and biblical concepts of parenting. And I want you, if you see a book there you haven't read, just dive in and, and pick one. And with your Bible open, try and learn some principles of discipline and discipleship in your home. And, and I don't see how a parent could possibly think that we can traverse the, the challenges of parenting without really becoming a, a student of parenting from a biblical perspective. Now, there's lots of stuff out there, but we need to get back to things that are carefully based on, on Scripture. So here's some things that, that might help you. And I challenge all of you parents to, uh, to grab one of those. At least one. All right. Correct because you love. Correct in love. Correction involves two sides. What are they? Discipline and discipleship. Both of those are part of it. Could more be said on that? Man, tons more, volumes more. But we've got to move on. Don't embitter your children. That assumes we're doing it in the right way. That right way, man, it needs to be elaborated on, but suffice this morning just to, to leave it at that. 21, into the verse, the, the attention shifts to a gauge. It focuses on, a, on an indicator. Don't embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Paul takes the, the, the focus of this verse and, and talks about what you can do and how you can do it in, in, a, in an embittering or, a, or an exasperating way. But then he goes to this measurable place and he says, and the kids, if you do it wrong, man, they can become discouraged. They can be discouraged. And to Paul, that's an important indicator. That's an important gauge. He gets the focus now in the success or failure of my parenting down to whether or not, in, in part, at least it's one facet, are they, are they discouraged? And that word may be a little too wimpy for some of you. The, the word literally is, is, is to, to lose heart, to lose the steam of life. I mean, literally, the work I did on trying to understand this word this week, it, it's a word that just, I've kind of lost the steam. I've just, oh. in some classical context, only used twice in the New Testament, but outside of the New Testament, sometimes it's used of a sail that is filled with air as it's pushed along by the wind, and then the wind dies, and that sail just goes limp. In your kid's heart, in his life, in his spirit, you see, Paul says, man, keep an eye on that. Keep, keep your pulse there. Because though some parents think that parenting is all about external behavior, it, it really gets down to the character we're building in his heart and the steam and the motive and the, and the direction of his life. Okay, put it down this way. Number three, if you would. You've taken notes. Jot it down like this. You and I, just a good gauge, and Paul puts the emphasis here, treat their hearts with care. You got kids? I mean, that needs to be the focus. I need to carefully parent the kid so that his heart... See, it is not deflated. So his heart is not in some way just let down. Now, discipline, does that let his heart down? No, don't, don't think that. These are not contradictory things. When Scripture says to discipline and disciple, it may be challenging and hard for them, but we need to carefully watch the heart of that kid. Can I say something about a lot of, of parenting models today? Okay, uh, here I go. Um, there are a lot of Christian parenting models today that unfortunately focus so much on the behavior of a kid. Is behavior important? It is important. I'm not saying it's not important. But all that attention to the behavior of a kid, whether it's based on schedules or words they say to address adults or whatever their thing is, it's all about these little cookie-cut things that are supposed to m define a well-behaved kid. There's so much focus on that that they've really lost perspective of what they're really parenting, something that will be there when they're 40, and that is their heart. I'm shaping character. 
You see, what I want to train my kid to do, just to think of some of those things, is to be faithful to his word. I want my kid to learn to honor people. Those are heart issues. See, some parents are working from the outside in, and they're, all they're worried about is whether they bark a certain you know, line out when they meet an adult, or if they put out their hand. And I'm not saying anything wrong with having your kids do some of those things. I'm just saying that ain't really where it's at. Okay? If those things help, great. But really what I'm concerned... I've had kids who got the line down. They come up to me and greet me with their parents' line that they've been taught. And in their eyes and in their heart, I can see there is no correlation between their heart and what they've been trained to say or do. And I'm saying the parent thinks he's winning the battle because he's got his kid to fit into this cookie-cut mold of what of a, a obedient kids are all about. But his heart is miles away. Be careful. You can feel good about your parenting because you got your kid in some kind of program or schedule or, or template and say, ah, I must be a good parent. Look at my kid. He jumps through the hoops, but his heart isn't there. And the text is saying, man, keep an eye on his heart. Keep an eye on his heart. Make sure your parenting is not exasperating your kids because he might be deflated. He might lose heart. And there are some kids that are still compliant on the outside, but their heart is completely discouraged. They lost their heart years back. Be careful. And to help me with this, I always try to keep a big perspective. I keep a big perspective. When people were telling me when we were having kids, well, you know, you've got to get them on this schedule, and this schedule, this is God's schedule, and here's how you do it. I'm thinking to myself, you know, was John the Baptist and Jesus on that schedule? I'm just thinking, come on. Now, I know this is tense for some of you, but I'm just saying, listen, really, did we, you know, was the bottle in his mouth uh, at 10, 2, and 4, or whatever? I, I don't think that's how it worked. And Jesus thought John the Baptist turned out pretty darn good. And, and I'm thinking, what we, we're, really we're really tied up about that? I mean, some parents think the bedtime is like the 11th commandment. And in, in that clock, it's going, and it's like, that's it, you know? And I'm thinking, is that really what I want to waste a lot of my parental energy on? Now, some of you who don't know me may think, oh, wow, he's a real free-spirited out, you know, wow, let the kids go. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a disciplinarian. I got limits for my kids. I got boundaries for me. There are rules in my house. But some of the people that misunderstand the heart issue have a rule-laden house. You know what I mean? Their home is full of rules. They got rules for this, rules for that, rules, here's how you stand, here's rules. I'm just thinking, wow, is that really what, what it's all about? I don't think so. We need to rethink this thing. Keep a big perspective. I want to think about parenting my kid, knowing that my kid, Lord willing, will be a brother in Christ. And one day at 40, I'm hoping that whatever I instilled in this kid, that heart and character I shaped, not a bunch of just external rules, but his heart that I helped to develop is, is part of, of what's made him as a 40-year-old. I mean, that's a bigger perspective than just saying, did my kid do the right thing and say the right thing when, when he met that person or when he sat at that restaurant booth or, you know, did he jump through that hoop today? Man, I, it ain't about getting my kids to jump through hoops. It's about developing their heart. You just need to understand the distinction there. Let me give you one more thing. It's a little bit different than what I've said so far that relates to making sure your, your kid's heart is not discouraged. Some parents, again, responding to the permissiveness of our culture, have swung the pendulum into this disciplinarian mode. And they've gone to that. And that's great. It's important to be a disciplinarian. But in doing so, they think it's all about correcting error and never mentoring or discipling with any kind of encouragement. The, in, in English, at least, the antonym for discouragement is encouragement. If I don't want my kid's heart to be discouraged, then i got to work pretty hard at getting my kid's heart encouraged. And some of us don't spend much time at that. We think with some perverted sense of biblical principle that if I encourage my kid, it may somehow backfire on me. See? Uh, he may just think that he doesn't have to keep the rules, or he may become prideful, or there may be some, and we, we skip it all. And yet here is God relaying to us a kind of, of, of parental uh, comment toward uh, his people by saying things in this parable about the servant and the master, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, there's no problem with God saying to us, Christ is coming and his reward is with him. Uh, there's no problem with Paul, for instance, as a pastor saying to the Corinthians, were the Corinthians the perfect church? Tell me that, Sunday school graduates. No, not, absolutely not. And the scripture, here's what Paul says about the Corinthians. He says, you have such a place in my heart, he says, that, that I would live or, or die with you. He says, I have such great confidence in you. I take pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged by you. Look at those statements to the Corinthians. Now, was there a lot to slam them for? Yes. Did he correct them and discipline them? Yes. But his heart was very interested in making sure, Paul's heart was very interested in making sure that the Corinthians' heart didn't become deflated. He encouraged them. You encourage your kids lately? I mean, really. I mean, have you encouraged your children? Is your encouragement as notorious as your discipline in, in your kids' minds? I mean, do they really sense that? 
I love the way Paul put it in Romans 11:22 when he looked at the heavenly Father. He said, "Oh, the kindness and sternness of God." I mean, there was those two things together. Was God a disciplinarian? Is he a disciplinarian? Yes. Is he kind? Oh, immensely. They're both important. But some of us have let the pendulum swing to one side. Man, let's just recognize double duty is to not only discipline our kids, but encourage their hearts. In the discipline and in the discipleship. Treat their hearts with care. Man, it's so important. You want more passages on this? I love these two. Hebrews 6.10, God is not unjust. He will not forget the work and love you've shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. If God says, I would be unjust not to recognize your progress and your successes, then who do we think we are as parents not to encourage our kids when they have them? First S 2.19, I love that one too, and 20. He says, what is our hope and our joy and our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? It's you. You guys, and I love it. He says, you are our, our glory and our joy. And, I, you know, I know parents take this too far too, but we need to rejoice and celebrate in our kids and therefore ensure that in our discipline and discipleship of our children, we don't dis discourage their hearts. I mean, for you not to really get on your knees and spend some time in God's Word and learn about discipline and discipleship in your home is something that every day, every week, every month, every year that you wait, you have lost opportunities. And the, and the clock is clicking. Your kids are going to be gone. And you need to make sure that you work hard, at not just once, but regularly pulling in and saying to God, God, how do I do this? And that's not just a prayer you pray and then you get up and wing it. And you work off the, you know, the, the cuff. You need to go for some answers. And that's why I try to provide some reading through this whole series. You need to do some reading. You need to get in the Word. You need to have somebody help you through this. And some of you have been hearing this message, and your kids are already out of the house. And my concern with you is you'll think, well, that's a, that's a great sermon for my kids or my, you know, my friends who are still parenting, but you need to become the mentors for us that are in the middle of it. You need to see it that you've experienced the teenage years, and some of us are just approaching them, and we need your mentorship in our life. It's not just a good Christian book on parenting. It's people that have been there and done that just a few years prior. So I challenge all of you, whether you're thinking about marriage, whether you're on your way to having kids, whether you're in the middle of it, or whether you've been through it, to make sure that we, we get down and, and seriously learn how God would like us to do this in the modern age. Pray with me. God, there are a lot of uh, couples here that... Uh, can picture uh, little faces in their minds right now, changing, uh, growing children. They uh, realize that the time for them to influence, parent, discipline, and disciple their kids is uh, fleeting. And some dads here that need to make some serious choices about their schedules, take a special trip with their kids, spend a few extra nights at home, pass on the promotion, perhaps even change jobs or even change careers for the time being because they need to spend more time with their children. God, let them secure those decisions now and not back down on them. God, help us to be good, uh, good parents. Ultimately, we're accountable to you and responsible to you for being good parents, and God, we want to uh, hear from you. Well done. Well done. And Lord, we need to raise up a generation of Christians that will replace us on this planet and in this church and in Christendom to carry the torch of Christ into this lost world and we cannot do that without giving attention to parenting. God, there are some here that are too permissive. Convict them. Let them start a, a more serious and more consistent pattern of discipline in their homes. There are some here that are uh, such disciplinarians that their uh, kids never hear encouragement from them and their hearts are in danger of being deflated. God, just uh, convict those parents. Let them find the balance between, uh, between firm discipline and, and notorious kindness. God, we uh, would pray for our church and for our kids that Many of them are in the nurseries right now, in the classrooms. Some of us need to apologize to our kids for being too permissive or being too, uh, too much of a disciplinarian to stop and see what they're doing right. 
God, we share in their depravity. Give us a sympathy for that depravity. Same problem they have is the same problem we have. We at least need to recognize our failures when we have them. So God, uh, a lot of places to start with this message, and I pray you'd put us to work on it this week. Lord, thank you so much for your word, and I know we can't even do justice to it in you know, half an hour, 40 minutes, but uh, provoke us to get in your word, excite us, use this message as a catalyst to become better parents, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.